ultimately, okay. I don't think the Pennsylvania is sweet. I don't no. think there's any that hand that you guys notice the the aroma and that sweet earthy flavor that's got. The, the, I've never experienced a tobacco that smells quite that way. I mean, it's it's one of the most unique tobaccos I think on the planet, and one of the only places where they grow, you know, black tobacco besides. Steve was saying Pennsylvania. Where well, else do they, they grow? grow they grow a broadleaf strain in Wisconsin called Comstock. Yeah. Wisconsin Comstock is a variety of broadleaf. I mean, you still have some. It's kind of a. I mean, there is some leaf they still call PA Barber, yeah. which was the original name broadleaf because PA Barber supposedly was the gentleman that first cultivated it. Right. Um, I thought the seed. They, it's a native seed. To well, what no? What it, what it is is it's. I think these guys have all heard this before, but there's five basic Criollo seeds. Yeah. Okay, and they all originated at the foothills of the Andes, mm -hmm. primarily Peru. Yeah. And your first Criollo came from that area of the world, which are Armada Finas, Armadas really, because your Mata Norte, your Mata Sul, your Mata Finas, that's the first Criollo. The second Criollo is the natural migration of that tobacco up through Latin America, through the Americas. And the next stop was in Mexico, and that's where your second Criollo occurred, and that's San Andres Negro. Then your third Criollo came from those seeds then being imported by the, or exported by the indigenous people via boat, canoe, however, to the Caribbean islands, and that's where our habanistas, our Cuban strains come from, which of course, if you tell a Cuban that all his tobacco originated in Mexico, he's not gonna, he's not gonna put up with that, but it is the truth. That Cuban seed was a Mexican seed to begin with. And then at the same time, that same Mexican seed migrated its way up through the Americas to end up finally getting up to, all the way into Canada, in fact, the Huron Indians were known for being big cultivators of tobacco. And that's where your broadleafs came from. And, what, and the reason why those are four individual Criollos is because of the distance and time and the separation. Those leaves then end up hybridizing, or those tobacco plants hybridized to their natural areas. Okay, because of the distance and time and separation, they kind of became unique strains onto themselves. And then the fifth one, anyone know what the fifth Criollo is? Anyone want to take a guess on that one? Java, Indonesia. Very good. Java, Indonesia, and those are the seeds. And those were the seeds that were that were basically exported by the Dutch traders, taking tobacco <laughs> seed from the New World to the Orient. And the separation of time and difference allowed those seeds to hybridize naturally. Because you know, originally, I mean, this whole concept of hybridizing naturally cultivating plants, it really, you know, farmers did it kind of in a hey, I'm going to save the seeds from this best pepper plant this year because this pepper plant gave me the best pepper. You know what I mean? But it wasn't really done with real intent other than trying to pick the strongest, healthiest, the one that gave, bared the best fruit. Really up until the early 1900s where they started to get kind of scientific about it when they started to understand that they could crossbreed and whatnot. And so it really wasn't until about 1910, 1912 or right. so where you started to actually get, hey, let's try to develop a different seed with intent. Through the through natural hybridization. Just going back though, from that spread from Peru, they recently the the gentleman who discovered the uh, saber tooth tiger discovered in Peru the first fossilized tobacco plant dating 2.2 million years old. Yeah. But the migration had to have happened, would you say, around 25,000? Mm. I mean, I know they didn't start cultivating They didn't start actively 8, cultivating 000. it somewhere between. They don't know. I mean, yeah, this, is, this is always debatable. a big debate amongst archaeologists as to whether it was corn, potatoes, or tobacco that was the first cultivated crop. You know, nobody Could knows. Have been at the same time, maybe. And um, well, they come from the, the right. Huron myth. Well, I mean. if I guys, I think I've told you this Huron myth before. Do you guys know that story? This is a great it's, it's story. One, it's just one of my favorite tales. The Huron Indians, you know, as with every culture of indigenous people, they have their own myths and legends. And basically, their story starts that you know the gods placed man upon the earth, but the earth was barren, so there was no way for man to eat. So the gods set forth a beautiful, lush, voluptuous woman, and she walked the lands naked. And every place that her left hand touched grew corn, and every place that her right hand touched grew potatoes. And then after walking all the plains and the planet, after seven days, she then sat and rested. This and when she rose, was fed. Right, and then when she rose from her rest, it's from beneath her ripe ass that tobacco grew. <laughs> and that's the Huron Indian myth. So, I mean, those three things are just so critically important to the, the Indian cultures of all of the Americas, those are the three key ingredients for them for subsistence, for, I'm for life. I'm just thinking for... of 
So you have 2.2 million years. That's when they date the sea. Right. Migration of, you know, across the land bridge and down. Right. They say happened. I, I'm pretty about, sure about 24 to 26,000, right around there. 30,000, yes. somewhere in that period. So there would have to be from that time for it to spread throughout all the Americas and. I mean, it's potential. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it definitely migrated with the people. And look, tobacco is a very, it's you know, tobacco you can grow pretty much anywhere. Tobacco is a very hardy plant. I mean, you guys could take tobacco seeds in every place where you live. You could all plant them in your backyard, and you could yield tobacco. It's not necessarily a difficult plant to cultivate. The issue is. It's like any particular plant variety, certain areas it grows better in, okay? There's that concept of terroir, which the French used to describe wines, you know. From the soil? Certain, right, certain tobacco. It's the same reason why are Idaho potatoes the better potatoes, and why are peaches from Georgia the way they are, and pecans from Louisiana. There are just certain eco-climates and soils that produce the best. Broadleaf from right. Connecticut. Broadleaf, right. You can't grow broadleaf. I mean, can you grow broadleaf here in Latin America? Sure. Absolutely. But it doesn't turn out to be the way it is when it's grown in the glacier soil. You know, it has its own characteristics. And as a result, it's very different. Because most of the seeds that you smoke, most of the different back varieties, I mean, I mean, Habana, Ecuador is Habana seed just planted in Ecuador. Habana, Connecticut is just Connecticut seed that was transported from the glacier to be planted down there. So, I mean, and Connecticut seed originally began as a seed that came out of Cuba to begin with. So it bounced from Cuba to the New England area, now it's back down in Ecuador. But it had, takes on different te different characteristic flavor, aroma, textures in the individual places it's grown. And then in addition to that, you also have the micro environment because you'll even see it in an individual field. I mean, you're looking for a place that has windbreak naturally. You want some place that has good cover. You want a place that typically lies lower than everything around it so it ends up being a nutrient-rich source. That's why valleys are very popular. They provide the wind shear. They also provide the heavier, denser nutrient value because they're getting all the erosion that's coming off the mountains over thousands of years or feeding into that valley. But you even see it like, do you guys even know what the word Hoya means? I mean, low sure. spot or hole? Sure. Right, it means a hole, a low spot. And that's why, you know, even in a particular field, typically the lowest spot in an individual given field tends to be the spot where the best tobacco grows in the field because it ends up typically being the most nutrient-rich portion of a field. And so that's, you, what, that's what happened with Connecticut. When that glacier receded 10,000 years ago, it left the Connecticut River, almost starts in Canada, divides New Hampshire, Vermont, through Massachusetts, into the Connecticut River Valley, empties into Long Island. It left the perfect meadows. For growing black tobacco, and it makes the makes permit. sense with erosion and everything. It would currently continue to be good planting. You know, mm -hmm. rain is going to run off the nutrients into the lower spots. Right. Exactly. It's a beautiful thing. So, you guys have any?